and welcome to our gold participants and listeners from around the world. I'm Kristen Schwarz, licensed midwife and MC for Gold Learning. And we are back here once again and this time today with a special guest who has made such a contribution to the field of midwifery and birth, Betty Ann Davis. Welcome, Betty Ann. Whatever it is that I'm coming in on, I, I don't know where which part of the world you're speaking uh, to at the moment. <laughs> I am so glad you are here with us today. So um, we are just here chatting a little bit about your upcoming presentation. You will be presenting for gold. Um, and the title of your presentation is Speaking Truth to Power, Childbirth Models in the Human Rights Frontier. You will be presenting for our Gold Midwifery Online Conference 2019. And would love to chat about that topic too. However, before we get started, I would like to talk a little bit about you and your background. You have such an amazing background. You traveled quite extensively. Um, you worked in the field out there. So tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your professional journey. Well, my professional journey started in a fairly humble place called Guatemala, where I saw my first births because I was caught there during an earthquake and I started to learn from um, the traditional midwives that were there but also the nurses that were American nurses that were there from the physicians that were there during that earthquake crisis and that is when I first started realizing that um, birth uh, can be out of hospital I had no idea that that was even something you did because I was from Canada and I went from uh, being I was in Guatemala for three or four years uh, I had my first son on the border of uh, Guatemala and Belize and then I moved to Alabama where I worked as a physician's assistant for some time um, in natural remedies and where I also helped to set up a uh, special birth center for um, um, people coming, this was in uh, Alabama, so it was between, it was very close to Phoenix City. It was in a place called Seal, Alabama, and close to Columbus, uh, Georgia. And at that point, I really started uh, doing more births and started learning much more um, from the physicians and the nurses again there. Um, and also, we were working with the, uh, the rural uh, African American population and I worked a little bit with the granny midwives there as well, the, the black granny midwives that were working in the late 70s and early 80s just before they lost their licenses. And then I moved back to Canada. Very good. So Thank in you Canada. For yes, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, in, in Canada what happened was of course I arrived in the early 80s when there was no legislation for midwives and I had just seen this terrible um, thing that had occurred to the women in Alabama where they were, had lost their, their midwives that they had used for some time and I began to realize that not only was Canada missing um, what I realized was an important profession because we didn't have midwives at all really at that time but we also uh, were not learning from our indigenous uh, sisters and so when I started working in Ottawa I, I just thought I, I really need to be doing this and people started asking me because I was already a midwife trained from outside the country if I would do births with them at home so I just started doing it. I didn't really think in terms of the legislation. There wasn't really any legislation possible at that time. Um, and at the same time, I was also being asked by the Inuit Women's Association to go north because they had heard that we were starting to think about doing home births and they thought it was just a revelation. It was like the renaissance of reason for them that white Hlanak women in the south of Canada should actually think on that level. So they asked me if I could come to talk to them in the north and to this is to the elders all across the north, all of who had different dialects, different Inuktitut dialects. And part of the reason they trusted me is because I'd had background in training with traditional midwives. Uh, both in Guatemala and somewhat from the Black Granny midwives and so they felt that I wasn't going to be um, pushing something on them that they didn't 
relate to very well. So I spent quite a bit of time up north in the early 80s and at that same time we were trying to work for legislation down south in both uh, Ontario and Quebec. I was straddling the river in Ottawa. Ottawa's um, right borders on the province of Quebec and Ontario. And I, um, we just started working towards legislation in those early 80s. And at the same time that I was starting to attend the Midwives Alliance of North America meetings that were across the United States and Canada and Mexico, um, and we started to learn from each other about how to bring about legislation for our various jurisdictions. So that's my background. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, you were quite instrumental to reintroducing um, home birth to Canada and uh, moving legislation forward. That's uh, absolutely wonderful to hear. And your background from, uh, you know, Guatemala and Alabama and, um, you know, actually learning from kind of the original midwives <laughs> there. Um, that is quite fascinating. So you have a wonderful background in there. Now I would like to talk about your topic, and it's uh, it's an amazing topic. Uh, the t title is there: Speaking Truth to Power: Childbirth Models on the Human Rights Frontier. And I, I I when I think about that topic, and I know you and I talked a little bit offline before. One of the things that just jumped into my mind was that in that two, in 2010, the European Court of the Human Rights. Um, recognized that the the right and privacy and and they also recognized in the case of it was a Ternovsky versus Hungary that the court held that a woman has the right to choose where whether to birth or give birth to a child and also where to give birth to a child so, so choice and um, brought really to mind the human rights issue of the of 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 birth and and it feels like okay it feels like we've come such a such a far way, and then sometimes it feels like almost we're taking two steps forward and one step back. I, what, what, what is your thought on that? Well, it, it was interesting for me because I came from uh, a back, different, differing backgrounds. I started um, really working with um, missionaries actually in Guatemala and in Belize, and then I started becoming very much a social activist. And so I was involved, you know, in the 70s, uh, 80s childbirth movements, and but not just the childbirth movements, but also the reproductive rights uh, movements mm -hmm. and uh, the women's movement. And we always considered ourselves activists on a number of levels. It wasn't just that. It was uh, concerns about the environment, concerns about... Um, well, we were involved in an entire counterculture trying to change the world, nothing short of trying to change the world, quite frankly. And so it wasn't just about childbirth um, that I became involved in, in these issues. But when the, it was actually the 2009 uh, UN Declaration on the Prevention mm -hmm. of Maternal Mortality and Morbidity, uh, became entrenched really at the UN that we started realizing how important the human rights issue is in childbirth. We had talked about it before but we were we were basically disenfranchised social movements on some levels although we had had we had been able to bring our our movement in Canada to uh, legislation in 1993. Uh, but still, a lot of our the, the the real thrust we were creating didn't necessarily carry itself all around the world, and we we found ourselves in Canada uh, wanting to do really change things in a way that we were we wanted to demedicalize birth, we wanted to make sure that women had the right to choose uh, where they were having their baby, with whom, and making sure that they would have it in the way that they wanted it. But when the human rights element entered the picture, it became an entire different uh, mm. platform. So when we were invited, I was invited to the uh, 2012 Human Rights and Childbirth Conference by Hermine Klein, who was uh, the lawyer majorly leading out in that, that um, uh, large meeting that was held in, uh, it was in, Den Haag in, in uh, mm -hmm. Holland. Um, she actually asked me not just to come to the conference but also 
to come and live with her midwife who had just had unfortunately a baby death at home who really needed some support and I realized and recognized that we were working on a different level at that point we were lurking, working uh, not just on legislation for midwives but mm. we were also working on that deeper cultural uh, paradigm of like really changing a paradigm it wasn't just doing legislation it was changing the whole culture around how we think about uh, our, our rights and we hadn't really until that time thought how important it is to use that particular um, entry into changing the world you know there's many ways you can do it and, yeah. and for us you know we weren't really thinking well I certainly as Canadians I mean one of the things I've always said for years when I've, I, I teach in women's studies and I've always said the difference between Canadian and American uh, feminists has always been that the the Americans tend to be um, uh, people that want to be they're, they're on the frontier but they're very they think very much in terms of an individual uh, process and and there's a bit more of a um, could you say a, st a stardom uh, that that f seems to follow American midwives? They they seem to and they seem to really like that. Whereas Canadians tend to not try to become famous. In fact, if you, if you're Canadian, you start becoming too well known. You're somewhat distrusted by the rest of your group because they think that you're trying to get draw too much attention mm -hmm. to yourself. Whereas we always did everything more in a community based system. So mm -hmm. when we went to when we decided to make changes, we'd always go to our legislatures because we trust right. in our legislatures. And that's why I think the Canadian midwives and I've written about this in one of the books I've written about it is in uh, Robbie Davis Floyd's book uh, Mainstreaming Midwives where I, I talk about I call it this chapter from um, from calling to career. Mm -hmm. uh, basically from social movement to professional midwifery project and what I talk about is the fact that we really feel that felt that in Canada we needed to change things with our legislation in order to get right. them synced with the population whereas in the states there's this huge amorphous social movement where th there's a lot of polarization but also mm. it's got a huge amount of energy it's and it's it's great there there's really a place for that big social movement and there's yeah. also a place for legislation and putting trying to put those two things together yeah. is one of the things that I really really started to understand yeah. and that's when I, I started writing more about and I did my undergrad my sorry my MA thesis uh, it was called from social movement to professional project are we throwing the bath the baby out with the bathwater because it was a little nervous in Canada that mm -hmm. we were getting so legislated so quickly that we were leaving our social activist roots behind and I felt very much that those are really important parts of whom we are yeah so that's so, that's a different that's, way of thinking the world so so this human rights issue was a different I, 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 again another layer mm. on top of social movements on top of legislation it was actually really seeking that larger larger cultural larger. change it's very interesting and and what you mentioned before makes a lot of sense but I do want to notice also that in the United States where I practice there's a lot going on on state levels I know that there are a lot of midwives involved in their state legislation depends on what state they live in in some states midwifery is still illegal you know there's no not much or it's illegal not much legislation to begin with but in the states um, there's quite a bit of movement too where, uh, where women try to or midwives uh, birth workers try to get changed through um, with their legislators as well you know so maybe harness that energy and that brings me to my next question actually that's uh, something I had also in my mind what would yeah. you reckon yeah right. I'm sorry go ahead go ahead I just wanted to say I, when I was talking about the difference between the fe feminists in, mm -hmm. in Canada and the states what I was talking about especially for the midwives was the, the Canadians just seem to go to legislation sooner uh -huh. and I think some of it also has to do with we don't have a huge massive medical monopoly uh, it, it's not just the midwives that think along that lines it's also the physicians think along the line community lines and so some of it has to do yeah. of course with our universal health care coverage mm -hmm. um, but ACOG has the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has had a huge stronghold um, so that politically they've been really 
mm. in the background constantly um, not giving midwives um, the ability to move very far. I mean, mm -hmm. we know about legislatures who have been yeah. really quite nervous about moving against the medical profession in any state or any, or definitely federally. And, you know, and we went, you know, when Obama came in asking for innovated um, um, programs that would right. be, he wanted, he, he was looking for something, anything that would, um, change the status quo and something that would be cheaper as well as innovative. Mm -hmm. Well, we zoomed yeah. right in. I went, I went yeah. down with Jenny Joseph and um, Ken Johnson, who is my uh, co my partner who um, with whom we did this, the British Medical Journal uh, home birth study and that got published in 2005. And we went with David Anderson, who was an economist, mm -hmm. um, the brother of one of the CNMs. And we, we lobbied uh, the, let the congressmen and senators about this very issue about what a great find they could have yeah. with this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, out of hospital birth. And we looked at the how we could save like about nine billion dollars if we just increased home birth by 10 percent in the U.S. And they they nod, but nobody quite caught the vision. Whereas mm -hmm. in Canada, in Canada, we just didn't have this. We, we certainly had opposition right. from physicians. And, you know, physicians, like anywhere in the world, wouldn't necessarily come to the whole meeting when we would be having our, um, there was a, a midwifery task force that, that um, brought in midwifery legislation in Ontario. And, mm -hmm. and the physicians would rarely attend the entire day, whereas everyone else was there for the entire day wanting to hear what everyone else said. The physicians would come, they'd, they'd say what they thought. They felt that we shouldn't be legislated or they thought we should be nurses and we shouldn't do home births or whatever. And mm -hmm. we all just agreed, and the lawyers just agreed, and the task force just agreed to disagree with the physicians. <laughs> <laughs> and that was acceptable in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. That's not acceptable in the States. What happens is you just, um, th there's just much more polarization between the midwives and the physicians. And I think that is really changing now with ACOG. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really something. Uh, be, and and the reason I think that's happening, it, it, it's one thing. Well, the main thing, I think, is clinical epidemiology and observational studies in epidemiology. The, it's the epidemiology and the research that brings people together. When right. you have no data, you're all just divided and, and telling your anecdotal stories. But when you've got oh, data, you yeah. cannot ignore it. And the Americans are, the ACOG um, mm -hmm. has finally come round. Um, for the first time they even mentioned research in their statements against home birth. Um, was in 2006, which was the year after we published our study in the BMJ on 5,418 uh, home births done with certified professional midwives across the states and a small percentage in Canada. And at that point, ACOG was saying, well, we're, we can't use, there mm. hasn't really been any study yet that's been published with, connected with an obstetric department as if you needed that as part of your <laughs> your <laughs> your your, your mm -hmm. um, uh, methodology um, and in fact it was connected with a an obstetric department because we did actually go to uh, various people at um, our own Ottawa University uh, University uh, Hospital here in uh, in Ottawa right. and after that they also ACOG was saying oh well yes but um, it's not it's just, it's just, the midwives are just giving the data they want. No, we had done it prospectively so that we had made sure that the midwives could not hide births. They had to account for all the births they had logged on. I mean, they were trying to pick apart that study desperately, and it wasn't really working, but they continued mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. And then when the Canadians and the Dutch came up with their other studies in 2009, they decided um, that, Yes, we have to admit there's now research, good research out there internationally, and they're they're just starting to come around on the fact that maybe that could actually happen here in the United States of America. So it's just it's an interesting um, uh, pattern to see how these things come about, how that how you can work them. But but the human rights frontier for for me right now is really really a good issue. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, and it's not just about um, 
it's not just about childbirth for me because I feel that most of the childbirth activists that I've associated with over the years are very much connected with other social movements. They're also connected with the environmental movement. They also want mm -hmm. um, a, 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 um, a healthy, clean earth. They also are concerned about the human rights of Indigenous peoples because midwives often tend to work with Indigenous peoples right. or with people right. um, in, certainly if, if you're traveling at all, you end up working with people in rural areas, in places where um, physicians often don't go. Um, donde no hay doctores, where are there are no doctors. And midwives tend to also uh, want to see general reproductive issues on the table. Right. It's not just about, it's, it's sexual exploitation. It, and, and midwives also really see the real problem of global capitalism and how it's on a, an entire uh, battle really with, um, with human rights in childbirth and human rights to healthcare. Global capitalism has unfortunately in their privatization, uh, not just of, of um, health, but also education, made it very difficult for uh, children of the world to get their education right. and for women uh, and all peoples to get health care. Right. right. I think it's all interconnected, and that's what, a very good point you made, that, that midwives who are out there um, concerned with with these issues, it's all interconnected. We're not just, you know, it's not just about birth. Yes, the environment, it's all, you know, together, indigenous people. So so it makes perfect sense to me that this issue is not isolated, but <laughs> uh, part of the bigger picture, right? Well, the other thing is that... Um... If you look at vulnerability analysis and you understand uh, how indigenous people and women uh, are vo both vulnerable groups, yeah. um, yes. you realize the, the similarities between those groups because they're, um, they're, they're two groups that ha are underpaid, they tend to be disenfranchised, mm -hmm. and they tend to have a lot of trouble that requires that they access government help. And unfortunately, in accessing government help, they end up getting government help that comes in a way that's not necessarily the way they wanted it. And mm, so yeah. you end up getting the, having these vulnerable groups who become victims again of the legislative processes. Mm. And those processes are often, you know, policymakers in some foreign country or even in your own country right. making policy for women or um, indigenous groups um, mm -hmm. that, that that they don't really have, a, they don't can't really um, relate to very much. So it, right. it's it's a it's a it's a difficult it's a circular circular problem. But I, I I do think that the the answer to all this is that best experts are the experts mm -hmm. that live in the community where they are. Absolutely, yeah. Now, with regards to the presentation, and, uh, you know, of course, we don't give too much away because we want our listeners to attend the presentation, but what are your hopes? Uh, what are you hoping our delegates will take away from this presentation, listening to you, watching your beautiful, you have some very beautiful slides there too, and some great, very good videos of, you know, so I had a sneak peek early on today when we looked <laughs> over your material. So what are your hopes that our delegates will take away from this presentation? Well, there are a number of things that uh, have been coming up for me for many years. Um, and I have, uh, um, I've been associating quite a bit um, on a new, a few books actually with uh, Robbie Davis Floyd, who's been a, just a, an angel for me and for many uh, midwives and uh, healthcare professionals who really want to see change in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm finding is that th the trouble that we're having in the high resource countries are often similar, they're often similar problems to what's going on in low resource countries. But What's really interesting to me is I think that the low resource countries have some really important lessons for us. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, and I'm really looking in, in, in this presentation about how power affects care. So what I find anywhere in the world is that health professionals tend to overuse their power and mm -hmm. entitlement, and they're also prone to bullying each other as well as patients. Mm -hmm. And that's interprofessionally, it's, it's doctor to nurse, it's nurse to midwife, it's among midwives, it's among nurses, especially among the um, female professions, unfortunately. But also, I'm hoping they're going to take away the fact that Trade policies and privatization have great power to corrupt care. Yeah. And one of the ways it's done that is through this skilled attendant clause, which I, I heralded it on somewhat level, but I always have always been leery of because I've had a real concern about the way the traditional midwives and people in their communities have been treated around this, especially when I found out that there were midwives that were getting um, uh, arrest, uh, traditional midwives that were getting arrested in the Philippines and, and when I recognized that part of the reason why the Philippines started to um, create a ban on home birth was because the physicians wanted uh, people to come to the physician to their private clinics because they get paid more and mm. and it yeah. and it's really a problem and that's yeah. a problem all over the world uh, where um, it's it's better for in Hungary, we saw it quite clearly when I when I was working yeah. with Aggie Gera before she was in jail in Hungary. It was very clear that the physicians were competing with the midwives. The physicians themselves were not getting paid very much, and they didn't want another profession to be um, bothering them. So they didn't want to uh, have home birth, and they put out some very strong statements against it. Um, so, so this this these trade policies and privatization are all interconnected with. Um, the medicalization of childbirth and the unfortunate um, problem of physicians wanting to have power over um, other healthcare professionals, allied healthcare professionals, and and it's a problem with lots of the um, uh, um, issues that uh, that go around the world, including the breach issue, which I'm dealing with in Ottawa right now. But the other thing I hope to, for people to take away is those are those are concerns. But the other thing right. that you take away. I hope it would be that communities have the power to come up with their own solutions, and and you know that we have the example of the of Mozambique and Tanzania, seeing the brain day drain of their physicians and realizing that if the physicians are going to leave their country or go to the cities to work, they're just going to train people who are not physicians, non physicians, to do cesarean sections, and they find that they're quite good and their data is just as good. Hmm. But oh, I think amazing. I think the so that that. That concern about or interest in having communities have their, you know, controlling their own situation, I think, is really key to to a lot of the problems that are going on. But I think the other thing is this convergence of social movements, of human rights declarations, of court cases now with um, um, touting the human rights declarations, the legislation, and the truth and reconciliation platforms that have been used in South Africa and now in Canada over the residential schools. These are all powerful components of affecting change. Mm -hmm. And really the final message I have is that speaking truth to power, both individually and collectively, is what's going to redistribute that power. Absolutely. I cannot wait for your presentation, Betty, and it sounds absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad you took the time to um, be here with me and uh, chatting a little. And it was been fascinating. I don't want this to end. You have so much knowledge to share and uh, so many um, experiences you had in other countries with all these midwives. I, um, I'm really looking forward to learning from you during this presentation. Thank you so much. Gosh, thanks. All right. We'll see you, um, I guess, February 4th. That is correct. So Betty and Davis's presentation, Speaking Truth to Power Childbirth Models on the Human Rights Frontier is our keynote opening presentation, or the opening keynote presentation rather, and is part of the Gold Midwifery Online Conference 2019. This presentation is open access. That means it is free of charge and um, 
This is an amazing presentation. I think everybody should watch this. This is not only a presentation for childbirth, you know, expert, you know, midwives and birth workers. I think everybody should watch this presentation, even if you're not in the field. It's it's fascinating. There's so much good information. We all need this. Um, so this presentation will be held live on February 4th, as Betty and Davis said just now, and she will be holding it twice. So to find out more about this presentation and when it's being held on your time zone, uh, please visit goldmidwifery.com. I thank you all for listening here with us today and participating, and I hope to see you at the opening keynote with Betty and Davis. Bye-bye for now.